This is King's Church Penwortham Podcast. This podcast features messages, homilies, and discussions centered around the Christian faith and how to grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The reading is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 4 to 11, and then 37 to 49. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armour of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Verse 37. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine, Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armour on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Amen. Well, have you ever felt like your Christian life is under attack? Yes. From the enemy? Yes. I don't mean just when you miss a bus or you can't find a parking spot outside because there's a football match on. But under attack maybe from temptation, or you feel like your faith is under attack, illness, circumstances, getting more than you can bear. And let's face it, most of us do sometimes in our life, don't we? And it's no surprise, I mean, Tony was reminding us this morning, but the Bible tells us, be watchful and vigilant. Your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion, and he prowls about looking for someone to swallow up or to devour. And the Bible tells us the enemy is a destroyer, a liar, a deceiver, who wants to undermine our faith. 
Uh, it's not to say that um, bad circumstances, you know, or illness are necessarily uh, in themselves attacks from the enemy. But the enemy's attack comes when we're then tempted to doubt God, to doubt his love and his sovereignty, or just slip into that feeling of hopelessness and despair. I can't go on like this. And we know there's no easy answer, but there is hope. And I'd like to mention five amazing incidents in the Bible where God's people are under very, very severe attack and it seems that they're defenceless against overwhelming odds. But where God didn't just strengthen them and help them to defeat the enemy, but God actually stepped in himself and he defeated and routed the enemy and his people didn't need to do any fighting. Well, in reality, we know, of course, that Satan has already been defeated. Uh, Tony's already uh, mentioned that. His fate is certain. God has always been infinitely more powerful than Satan. After all, God is the creator of all things. And, uh, but we see that victory being worked out uh, on the earth in our Lord Jesus Christ, who totally defeated Satan when he died on the cross, paid the penalty for our sins, rose again on the third day, ascended to heaven, and now he sits enthroned in glory to reign forever, to rule and reign at the right hand of the Father. However, that victory now needs to be realised and worked out in our own lives, doesn't it? Incidentally, talking about temptation, I like the story told by Vernon McGee on his radio talk. And we all know what a pantry is. Pantry is like a cold room in the older houses where they used to keep food uh, before fridges came along. And uh, he tells the story of a, of a little boy being looked after by mum. And uh, everything in the house, there were just the two of them, but everything, house, everything in the house was quiet. And if you've ever looked after children, you know that quiet is not a good sign. <laughs> Unless they're fast asleep, that's okay. Uh, and she shouted out, Johnny, where are you? What are you doing? He said, uh, I'm in the pantry, mummy, looking after, uh, look, uh, avoiding temptation. <laughs> this angry voice came back, Johnny, get out of that pantry. That's no place to go and avoid temptation. Well, it's good advice for us, isn't it? The point is, we don't put ourselves in a situation where we're going to be tempted. But back to these Bible stories where God dramatically intervenes. What was it that enabled this intervention by God when it seems that God does the fighting and not us? Fascinating, I find it, to see that it's him that routes the enemy, not his people. And can we learn anything that will help us when we feel under attack? Now, I've got five this morning, and uh, there are more, but I'm going to link them with the five smooth stones that David carried when he fought Goliath. You know, the people of Israel were settled in the Promised Land, but very often they came under attack from the enemies all around them. And the first story, I'm not going to read the stories because there just isn't time, I'm just going to summarise each one, and some of them you'll know quite well. But if you want to read it later, it's in 2 Chronicles 20, and it's an absolutely wonderful chapter to read. 2 Chronicles 20. Jehoshaphat uh, is the king of Judah, that's the southern part of Israel, and there are three invading armies all came to attack Israel all at once, from Moab, Ammon, and another group. And when the Israelites saw this vast army lined up against them, the king and his people went into the temple, they pleaded their case before God, and they said, we're helpless against this vast army. And incidentally, these three armies that had come to attack Israel were were from nations that God had forbidden the Israelites to attack when they were travelling from Egypt to the Promised Land. But the prophet of God gives the king those famous words from 2 Chronicles 20.15, which many of us will know. Don't be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Shall we say that together? 
Don't be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Well, what does the king do then? He doesn't go home and put his feet up. Verse 20 says he gets up early in the morning and he sets out for the battle lines and the king appointed singers to sing praises to God. And they would go at the front of the army praising God. And you might think, well, what good is that going to do? Verse 22 is very interesting. It says, the very moment that the singers started praising God, God caused the three armies that had come up against them to start fighting each other. And when Israel came to the, to the battle line, looking for this vast army, all they found was corpses. The three armies had all completely destroyed each other. Well, what can we take from this story that might help us when we are under attack? What was it that routed the enemy in this story? Yeah, it was God. But what was it on man's part? Praise. Praise. That was leading the army of resistance. And the very moment they started praising God, the enemy was confused and routed. And praise needs to be at the head of our defence against the enemy attacking us. Praising God in our hearts, thanking him, worshipping him, not just Sunday morning, but every day. I don't know if that story, maybe it's one of Kevin's that we've heard before about the Welsh preacher, who always liked to start at his service with a prayer of thanks to God. And this morning, um, it was absolutely pouring down and gales and cold and all the, all the congregation thought, oh, we've got him this morning. What on earth can he find to thank God for? And when he started, he said, thank you, Lord, that it's not always like this. So let's say we, we need um, a, a, a fundamental attitude of, of thanksgiving and praise in our lives all the time. We don't thank God for the bad things that come, but we can thank him in every circumstance. Thank him for his goodness and his love and his kindness. You know, that incident that Ray mentioned this morning about his wife. Just find something every day to thank God for. There's always uh, so many things that we can praise him for in himself, his character, his grace, but also what he's done for us, you know, our health, measure of health and strength. Mary Jones always prays, doesn't she? Thank you for the measure of health that you've given us today. So let's say the first smooth stone is praise. And remember that if we feel we're under attack, let's keep praise and thankfulness to God at the centre of our lives. Not be grumblers, but be thankful. Because if we, can, if we do what we can do, God will do what we cannot do. Second story is 2 Kings 19. And uh, again, Israel threatened by invasion. This time Hezekiah is king in Jerusalem. And Israel is under attack from another vast army, this time the Assyrians, who were notoriously cruel. And the enemy had surrounded Jerusalem and it was under siege. To rub salt into the wound, King Hezekiah receives a letter from the enemy saying, your situation is absolutely hopeless. It's futile to think that your God can save you and this city. What does Hezekiah do? In great distress, he goes straight to the temple, spreads out the letter before God, and he states his case before God and calls on God for help. He ends his prayer and now, O Lord our God, please save us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. And in the night, the angel of the Lord goes through the enemy camp, causing devastation. And in the morning, the Assyrians find that there are so many of the soldiers have died during the night that immediately they pack up their stuff and they go back to their own land. Jerusalem and Israel are saved. So out of this long siege where the people would be exhausted, no strength left. They were in a hopeless situation. But God saw to it they didn't even need to fight. He dealt with the enemy for them. What can we glean from this story that helps us? 
Well, when they came to the situation where they had no strength left, they were overwhelmed and hopeless, like we sometimes feel. But what was it that routed the enemy this time? Yeah, it was God, but on man's part, it was prayer. They turned in desperation to God, laid out their case before God, uh, and, and, and in, 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 in the humble and desperate prayer, they laid their case before God, and that very night God caused confusion amongst the enemy, and they were routed. How important it is that we take time to meet with God every day. Spend, not just, you know, like Kevin keeps saying, don't just say prayers, nothing, I love prayers, <laughs> say prayers. But that's not all, you know, we open our hearts to God, and it's meaningful time with God. Confessing our faults, our needs, thanking him and praising him and praying for his will and his glory. So let's say the second smooth stone is prayer. And remember, if we're under attack, let's keep persistent in our praying. Because if we do what we can do, God will do what we can't do. The third story is a more familiar one. And it's Judges 7 and it's the story of Gideon. This time, Israel sitting there comfortably, but they're being attacked by the Midianites, the Amalekites, and another group from the east, people of the east. And in Judges 6, we see these three armies causing absolute havoc with the raids into Israel, so that the children of Israel are reduced into living in caves and dens in the mountains, terrified and feeling helpless. And God comes to Gideon and calls him. And Gideon thinks, what on earth can I do? We're helpless against these vast armies. And uh, the Lord says to him, surely I will be with you. And you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Well, Gideon's faith, as we know, is very, very imperfect. And God reassures him with promises and encourages him with signs. Almost as if the Lord is saying, I know you can't do it on your own. But... I'm going to do this, not just for Israel, not just for you, but for my glory. So that when Gideon calls together his army and it's 300,000, God says, too many, because I know what's going to happen. Israel is going to claim glory for itself and says, I've done this. And they're not going to give glory to the God of heaven. So eventually it's whittled down and they end up with 300 men. So when this vast army uh, came up to invade Israel and Gideon went to overlook their camp, we read now the Midianites, Amalekites and all the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts and their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. We learn later that there were at least 135,000 soldiers. So we've got Gideon with 300 men how is he going to defend against this formidable army? Well, in the middle of the night, as you, if you know the story, Gideon gave each man in his right hand a trumpet to blow and uh, in his left hand a clay jar with a lighted torch inside. And Gideon positioned them all round the enemy camp by night. And on a given signal, the 300 men blew the trumpets they brought the jars to reveal the lighted torches and they shouted, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. As soon as they did that, chaos immediately broke out in the enemy camp and the three different factions within the camp all started fighting with each other. And the whole army just eventually scattered, fled away from Israel, whilst the 300 soldiers we just left stood there all around the camp, never lifting a finger apart from to blow the trumpets. Now I'm sure with those 300 soldiers, watching in disbelief, didn't turn to each other and say, we certainly showed that 135,000 a thing or two, didn't we? I think they'd be, what happened? How did the Lord do that? Well, what can we learn from that? 
Well, Gideon and the 300 couldn't defend against the attack themselves. But this is what I picked out of this. They did what they could. They didn't just sit and wait around for the enemy to come. They did what they could, even if it was just blowing trumpets, shouting and bringing light into a dark place. But they were proactive in putting themselves in the right position. You know, like when a farmer wants a good crop, he doesn't just sit and pray that God will send a good crop and thank him for the miracle of good crops. Uh, he has to get up out of bed and go and sow the seed. If we are struggling, say, with temptation, whether it's keeping clean, a clean mind, which is so difficult nowadays, or whether it's anger, or doubting God, or doubting his goodness, or something else, we need to do all we can to avoid putting ourselves in a situation where we are going to be tempted. If what we see on TV is a problem for us, all we switch off at nine o'clock. Although that's not much of a safeguard nowadays, isn't it? Better just put the TV in the bin. If listening to the radio is something that really troubles us, makes us over anxious, put that in the bin too. If the internet's a problem, get rid of it altogether. There's still room in the bin. It's difficult to believe, but they tell me that life did actually exist before smartphones, iPads, and even before the internet. Ah, I know the Bible says that God gives us all things richly to enjoy, doesn't he? But not if they expose us to attack from the enemy. It, 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 they're, they're very serious, these sort of things, aren't they? Because, you know, God gave us, graciously, most of us, two eyes. But even Jesus said, if your right eye offends you, get rid of it. You know, he gave us two hands, but if your right hand offends you, get rid of it. Because for most of us, with less than 100 years left to live, and how we live the rest of the lives that we've got, determines the whole eternity for us. C.T. stood, wrote, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So let's put in our third smooth stone, proactive. And if we can do what we can, can do, God will do what we cannot do. So constant praise and thanks, heartfelt prayer, being proactive, and the fourth story. Now I want to take us right back, I get a very well-known story to the very beginning of the nation of Israel, Exodus 14. You remember they'd been slaves in Egypt for 400 years, then God sent Moses to lead them out of Egypt to the Promised Land. And after the 10 plagues, Pharaoh said, leave, get out. And Moses led them out, and they started on the long march of the Promised Land. Men, women, children came to the barrier of the Red Sea, they set up camp free from slavery. Everything's looking good. But then Pharaoh changed his mind again and he set off with his vast army to bring them all back into slavery. Satan always wants to keep his people as slaves, doesn't he? And usually he uses people to do that. And here he used Pharaoh. So children of Israel camped by the Red Sea. Suddenly in the distance he saw this huge Egyptian army bearing down on them, headed by 600 chariots. In the front of the right, next was the Red Sea. Behind them was Pharaoh's army. They couldn't flee to the right, they couldn't flee to the left, they'd left, they'd just be overtaken by Pharaoh's army. Situation's hopeless, there's no escape. What are they gonna do? Well, God completely turned the tables. Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Good for Moses, he had confidence in God. But the Lord said to Moses, tell the children of Israel to move. Don't stand still, move. Move forward. You lift up your staff over the Red Sea, and it'll part for you to go on dry land. 
Well, of course, that's exactly what they did. Water dried up and all Israel went through to the other side. Then when they're all safely through, the whole Egyptian army tried to follow them and God said to Moses, now you stretch out your rod over the sea again and it'll come back. And that's exactly what happened. The sea came back and all the Egyptian army was drowned. Reminds me of the story uh, many years ago of a liberal preacher in a little country church and uh, talking about the, uh, the Red Sea. And they said, well, we, we know better now, of course. He's one of that type, you know. Uh, it wasn't actually a, a big sea. In fact, it wasn't the Red Sea at all. It was really called the Reed Sea. And it was just like marshy ground, probably about 18 inches deep. Well, uh, after, the, after, the, after the service, uh, a little farmer went up to him and he, uh, the preacher said, oh, I'm going to be in trouble now. And uh, but the, the, the farmer said, hey, by gone, preacher, thanks for that. That was great. Uh, you know, I'd always think that water were about 100 foot deep. But now to think all them were all drowned in 18 inches of water. <laughs> Point is, the children of Israel didn't need to do any fighting. They just did what God had told them to do. That marvellous. They just did what God had told them to do and God routed the enemy and took them through on dry land and they were out free into the desert. Moses did his part, the children of Israel did their part. They moved forward in trust, but then God did the rest. So let's put on that fourth stone. They knew and obeyed God's word. When we're under attack, we don't just sit and wait for God to do something. Like them, they did exactly what God had already said. He obeyed his word. And that's what we need to do, to know and to obey God's word. And then we can trust God to do what we cannot do. Brings us to the fifth stone. Well, let's go right back to the story that Strawberry read, David and Goliath, which I'm sure we all know, like the back of our hand. The children of Israel settled in the promised land, but again they were under attack and they kept being harassed and invaded, invaded this time by the Philistines. And their fierce, uh, uh, Philistine, Philistine fiercest warrior, Goliath, heads up the battle line and he challenges Israel to put up their champion to fight. So we have Goliath, a battle-hardened warrior, a big man, which is an understatement, probably about over nine foot tall, armour weighing, weighing 125 pounds, spear weighing 20 pounds, against David, a teenager. What the strawberries were? Was it a young, young lad or something you read? Something like that? And his brothers thought there's nothing special about him. And uh, no weapon except a sling and five smooth stones. So, you know what happens? Goliath ridicules David, curses him by his gods. But David runs towards him and he says, you come to me with a spear and a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And he takes a stone out of his bag and with one slingshot, he downs the giants flat on the floor and the whole Philistine army turned and fled. I know it's a little teeny bit different from the other stories because although the children of Israel didn't have to do any fighting, uh, David did actually fling one stone. So a little bit different, but the principle's all the same. I'm sure you'll agree. It's God that really routed the enemy. He won the battle for them. So what do we put on the fifth stone? I suggest complete trust in God to defend his children and to resist any attack of the enemy. Supreme trust in the Lord. We always need to keep our eyes on the Lord. Just like Tony was reminding us again this morning, Ray started that lovely song at the beginning. Keeping our eyes on him, trusting him, that he is working out his purposes in his own way. And if we trust him, it will work to his glory and to his honour and to our blessing. So, with five smooth stones representing the things 
we need to build into our lives. Praise and thankfulness, heartfelt prayer, being active, proactive, knowing and obey God's word, and complete trust in the Lord. Now somebody's probably thinking, wait a minute, if David had smart five smooth stones, but he only actually used one. You're right, but at least at this early time in his life, he had, he had all five in his arsenal. They were all there in his bag. They were already there built into his life, underlying that total trust that he had in God. I mean, we see it all in that lovely Psalm 23rd Psalm, don't we? All these uh, good attributes. Uh, and we know Psalm 31, I will, I will bless the Lord at all times. His prayer shall continually be in my mouth. A man of prayer, Psalm 63, Oh, God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. He ran to Goliath. He knew and obeyed God's word. He said they're like, God's words are, are like pure silver, purified in a furnace, purified seven times. Um, so if we feel we're under attack from the enemy as followers of the Lord Jesus, we're children of God, we're loved by our Heavenly Father. Let's remember those wonderful words from 2 Chronicles 2015. The battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not yours, but God's. Prayer, and as we do our part of constant thankfulness and prayer, praise, prayer, obeying his word, what he's already told us, doing what we can do, we can have confidence that God will do what we cannot do. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Can I just pray to close? Heavenly Father, thank you that our Lord Jesus has already overcome the enemy. And thank you that now he that is in us, your Holy Spirit, is greater than he that is in the world. Satan is already a defeated enemy and his end is certain. But we still so need your help to make that victory real in our lives, Father. We know we don't need to let temptation overrun us. That when we're suffering through illness or sorrow or other difficulties, we don't need to despair or to doubt your goodness or your love for us. Please give us the grace to trust you through all the attacks we face from your enemy. Give us the grace to keep trusting you, to keep praising and thanking you every day and persisting in prayer with you, reading and obeying your word, prompting, prompt us, Lord, to do our part, to do what we can do, but then to be able to trust you to bring us through victorious, still praising and honouring you, through all our your wonders that you allow into our lives, that we may bring glory to your wonderful name. Amen. We trust this episode has blessed you. For further inquiries, please visit our website, kingschurchfm.org.uk. Connect with us on our Facebook page, Kings Church Penwortham, or Instagram at kings underscore church underscore Penwortham. You can also send us an email at kingschurchpenwortham at gmail.com. 